Okay, good morning friends. A word of prayer before we begin today. We're going to be uh, talking about Hebrews chapter 7. And uh, as I've uh, asked for prayer in this connection, pretty much since we started Hebrews, pray that the Lord makes sense of the passage for us so that we can understand and see and grasp his gospel in it. Lord Jesus, we do ask you for that today. We pray that you would be alive in the reading of your word and that your power to save us and uh, bring us the joy of reconciliation with you would work in our reading and our discussion today. Lord, I pray that you would anoint my lips and that you would uh, anoint the ears of your people to hear, your, to hear about your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, friends, Hebrews uh, continues to be strange and complicated. Uh, we're going to talk about the first few verses of chapter 7 today, but just a quick word of, of context uh, by way of reminder. The main idea so far of Hebrews is, anybody remember, can, we, can someone say it to me today? No? That's okay. Don't forget. Don't forget. Don't forget. Thank you. Pay close attention. Maybe even pay closer attention to what you heard, lest you risk falling away. Because if you neglect so great a salvation, how will you escape? Right? We talked about that last time, and that, indeed for several weeks now. And why, what is the threat, the implied threat there? That the God of the Old Testament, that Hebrews guy is explaining to us, the God of the Old Testament keeps his promises. He is reliable above all things. Inscrutable, yes. Hard to follow sometimes, but when he says something, for example, I will bring judgment against you, he is not kidding. We have the evidence of 722 with the Assyrian captivity, we have the evidence of 586 with the Babylonian captivity. The Hebrews guy wants us to keep all those things in mind. If you depend on some sort of physical, personal, human, fleshly method of salvation, you will not escape. The God of 722 and the God of 586 will get you. <laughs> so, the great salvation that the, he the writer to the Hebrews is explaining is the thing we got to pay closer attention to. And so he goes on, and now we're into chapter 7 of this plan, to explain the weird shape of the Old Testament. To explain the ins and outs of the Old Testament sacrificial system. The ins and outs of the Old Testament covenant system. So that you will understand at a deep level exactly what this great salvation is. And today, he brings up the thorny, weird story of Melchizedek as a case in point. So let me read from the last verse of chapter 6 on into chapter 7, and let's see what in the world he has to say. He's, in chapter uh, 6, verse 20, he says, Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And then he continues in chapter 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him. And to him, Abraham apportioned a tenth part of everything. He, Melchizedek, is first by translation of his name, king of righteousness. And then he is also king of Salem, that is, king of peace. He is without father or mother or genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but resembling the Son of God, he continues a priest forever. See how great this man was, to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the spoils. And those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these also are descended from Abraham. But this man, who does not have his descent from them, received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now it's beyond dispute that the inferior is blessed by the superior. In the one case, tithes are received by mortal men, but in the other case, by one of whom it is testified that he lives. One might even say that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor Melchizedek, sorry, of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. The word of the Lord, strange though it may be, from Hebrews chapter 7. 
So I hope today to give you guys a little handle on the Melchizedek idea, the Melchizedek story, and how it fits into the strange Old Testament world that God revealed himself through. The Melchizedek story itself comes from Genesis 14. Are you familiar with it? It's interesting that Hebrews guy has basically quoted it word for word because it's very, very short. I'm going to read it to you in the original in Genesis 14. After his return from the defeat of Shador Laomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaba, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him, blessed Abraham, and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. That, my friends, is it. That's the story of Melchizedek. That's the whole thing. 100% of the textual evidence we have for Melchizedek's existence and nature and genealogy. In fact, most of the stuff we have about Melchizedek is from Hebrews, chapter 7, where the Hebrews guy goes into a long explanation of who Melchizedek was and what he means. But the historical situation is Abraham went to rescue his nephew Lot from five um, kings who had kidnapped him. And he defeated them all, and as he was coming back from their slaughter, Melchizedek met him, gave him bread and wine, and blessed him. And Abraham, responding to this blessing, gave Melchizedek a tithe of all his possessions. Why? What is that story all about? Why is it related to, and how is it related to a gospel that is so great that we must not forget it at the hazard of our souls? What is there about the Melchizedek story that's so important? Well, it turns out that it's very, very significant, but in order to understand it, we have got to understand the priestly system a little bit. And Hebrews guy knows this because he immediately, after describing Melchizedek for a minute, says, and those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though they too are descendants of Abraham. And so Hebrews guy says, look, in order to understand the significance of Melchizedek, you need to understand and remember the Levitical priestly system. I told you last week or the week before that Hebrews is all about explaining and understanding the significance of the strange system of rites and liturgies that was the ancient Near Eastern sacrifice system. And that, and that understanding it in its depth and in its intricacies is going to help us and encourage us to have confidence in the hope we have going forward. So I ask you today, how much do you know about the origins and the structure and the nature of the Levitical priesthood? Let me follow that up with another question. Does that sound interesting to you? <laughs> Well, it should, because it turns out that both in its history and in its shape, it's directly relevant to issues of the gospel that we struggle with every day, directly relevant to the plight of our souls. And so I would like to back up one step from Melchizedek himself and talk to you about the Levitical priestly, I can't even say it, <laughs> hopefully I can explain it, the Levitical priestly system for just a minute. And we're gonna our, use as our jumping off point this line in Hebrews, and those descendants of Levi who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers. You know this, did you know this? That the Levites, the tribe of Levi in the Old Testament, received tithes from the rest of the Israelites and lived off them while they performed duties in the tent of meeting, in the tabernacle, right? But did you, do you know what these duties were? And do you know how the tithes were apportioned? And do you know the significance of what they were doing there in terms of the theological relationship between all those groups? I didn't really either until I started investigating. And a lot of it comes from the book of Numbers. So it's going to get weirder yet. <laughs> Would you turn with me to Numbers 18? Turn with me to Numbers chapter 18. This is really fascinating. And I hope I can convince you of that as we go forward here. I'm going to start with verse 21. 
because this is the, the, the literal reference that Hebrews guy is making. Leviticus 18.21, to the Levites, says the Lord, I have given every tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for their service that they do, so that the people of Israel do not come near the tent of meeting, lest they bear sin and die. Okay. I'm going, to, I'm going to summarize that in colloquial 21st century English. I'm giving the Levites all the money of the offering that the children of Israel offer so that they can do things in and around the temple that will prevent the death of all Israel. The Levites are going to protect with this money. They're going to live to protect their brothers, their countrymen, from death at my hands. That's what the Levites are doing. And actually in verse 21 it says, or sorry, 22, so that the people of Israel do not come near the tent of meeting lest they bear sin and die. And from that verse it gets even more specific. What God is saying is, I have set the Levites up to be supported by tithes so that they can prevent their countrymen from drawing near to God because that would be fatal. Have you ever thought about the priest, the Old Testament priesthood in that way? That it was designed to prevent the approach of God's people because if they approached him, they would die? I never really thought of it in quite those terms before. The, the Levites and the, the Aaronic priests, the descendants of Aaron specifically, were involved in a system of fences, a system of walls and of barriers the crossing of which resulted in the death of the crossers at the hand of God. It gets even more specific if you read the rest of Numbers chapter 18. If you're there in Numbers 18, go back to the beginning of the chapter. So the Lord said to Aaron, You and your sons and your father's house with you shall bear iniquity connected with the sanctuary. And you and your sons with you shall bear iniquity connected with your priesthood. You ever read that verse before? In instituting the Levitical priestly system, God said, You priests and you Levites shall bear iniquity connected with your job. What does that mean? What does that mean? Look down at verse 3. They shall keep guard over you and over the whole tent, speaking of Levites, but shall not come near to the vessels of the sanctuary or to the altar, lest you all die. And look down at verse 7. I give your priesthood as a gift, and any outsider who comes near shall be put to death. How are these ideas, what are, what are Levites up to? How are these ideas related? What does it mean to bear iniquity? I want to suggest to you that the Levite's job, the Levite's job was to prevent the approach of God's people into his presence, because that would kill them. But that the Levites could stand in God's presence based on some particular characteristic that they had. What is it? What is the what is the Levite what do the Levites have in the verses that I read to you that qualifies them to stand in the presence of God? This is going to blow your mind. What does he say to Aaron and his people? Your job is to what? Bear, sin. Bear iniquity. And the Levites in protecting you in your work will bear iniquity. What's iniquity? Sin, right? Aaron's job is to take the sin related to the sacrificial system on himself. The Levite's job is to bear, to carry, to take on themselves iniquity and sin. Do you know what qualifies them to stand in the presence of God? It has something to do with bearing sin. What? Isn't that the opposite of what we have think and learn and hear about the priest? The priest is sprinkled. The priest goes into the Holy of Holies and he's holy. 
Except it sounds like the priest is doubly sinful. It sounds like he's got no, not only his own sins, but he's got the sins of the people too. And that that somehow makes him eligible to go into the presence of God. We've got to dig into this a little bit deeper. We've got to see some uh, more of the intricacies of the role of the Levites and the place that they actually played in God's economy. So I want to go back even further to Numbers chapter 8. I promise we'll get back around to Hebrews, but it's important. When the Lord is given the instructions for initially setting the Levites apart for their work, which remember is to, well, I was going to, I was going to, um, I was going to present it this way as, as a, a long time, lifelong member of a low, low church where we set up chairs every Sunday. <laughs> Wait, <laughs> Levites <laughs> set up chairs. That's their job. Right? Their job is to put the piano in place and the chairs and set the coffee up so that the service of God can go forward, right? And their job is to mind the door and hand out bulletins, right? That's what they do. But how, for what purpose did God set them apart for this work? What is their theological purpose? Look at Numbers chapter 8 and verse 16. For they, the Levites, are wholly given to me from among the people of Israel. Instead of all who open the womb, the firstborn of all the people of Israel, I have taken them for myself. For all the firstborn among the people of Israel are mine, both of man and beast. On the day that I struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I consecrated them for myself. Speaking of the firstborn. And I have taken the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the people of Israel. And I have given the Levites as a gift to Aaron and his sons from among the people of Israel. Do you see what the Levites' role is in the economy of God? I have taken the Levites to myself instead of what? Your firstborn son. I have taken the Levites to myself instead of your firstborn ox. I have taken the Levites to myself instead of that thing that I demanded of you on Passover day. Instead of that Pharaoh's son that I killed with my angel of death. I've taken the Levites to me as a substitute for all of that. You, Levites, shall bear iniquity in your work in my tabernacle. You will be the objects of my judgment in the place of all my people. You will be a substitute object of my wrath. What is it that qualifies you to stand in the place of God, to stand before God in the Old Testament priestly system? We're getting there. It has something to do with bearing iniquity, something to do with being a sacrifice, something to do with being an object of his wrath. There's one more thing about the Levites that you might know that also comes out of Numbers chapter 18. So go back up to Numbers 18. This, by the way, every, every detail of this Levitical situation is repeated over and over again in Numbers 18, partially because the writer of the Old Testament they sort of wrote sort of cyclically. They said things two or three, four times. Ancient Hebrew has its, has its shapes and has its customs. But I think the, the writers also tried to emphasize these, these things. To the Levites, verse 21 of Numbers 18. Uh, sorry, let's go to verse 20. And the Lord said to Aaron, You shall have no inheritance in their land, neither shall you have any portion among them. I am your portion and your inheritance among the people of Israel. We always focus when we think about that concept on the second part. God himself is their portion. But let's focus on the first part of that verse for a minute. What is the Levite situation in the promised land? With respect to land itself. I want to put a fine point on it. They are disinherited. They are disinherited. If the covenant with the people of Israel is, I promise to give you a land of your own. And it looks like it is that in various places in the Old Testament. What does he say to Levi? 
except for you. <laughs> and do not get land. If the covenant is land, you are outside the camp. If the, if the covenant is life, and life is real estate, you are dead. You see it? He says to the Levites, covenantally speaking, I sacrifice you. I consecrate you to myself. And we think consecrate is a good thing. I consecrate you to myself, which means I give you, I don't know, a consecration robe. And like, a, I don't know what, <laughs> what we think it means. What does it really mean? You're set aside. In what way? What's the instrument of consecration? It's a knife. The instrument of consecration is sacrifice. I consecrate you to my... The firstborn is consecrated to the Lord. What does that mean? It means he gets killed. It means he gets sacrificed. He gets slaughtered for the sake of the secondborn. Right? The firstborn is slaughtered, consecrated for the sake of all his brothers so that they can live in the peace and approval of God. Do you know what the Levites, their whole job was? To bear the sin. And not just the sin, but the judgment, the covenantal judgment of God and of all of their brothers so that his wrath would be satisfied. And in the exchange by which they took this place, they got paid for it. They got paid for it. All of their brothers, the Levi Levites brothers said, you guys have tough duty. And so here is a tenth of all our stuff so that you can live under this judgment. You can live under this condemnation, under this, we'll call it consecration. But covenantally speaking, I think it's important that we see in the intricacies of the Old Testament system that the Levites took on covenantal death for the sake of their brothers. Do you think that's significant? Do you think Hebrews guy wants to talk about that just a little bit? Let's go back to Hebrews now. Those descendants of Levi, chapter 7, verse 5, who received the priestly office have a commandment in the law to take tithes from the people, that is, from their brothers, though these are also descended from Abraham. One might even say, verse 9, that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, for he was still in the loins of his ancestor when Melchizedek met him. He's talking about Melchizedek as being a better version of the Levitical priestly system by reminding his readers of what that original Levitical priestly system looked like. And what did it look like? It looked like the Lord saying to his people, of the best of your produce, I will take in consideration of your sin. And the rest I will leave now that my wrath has been satisfied. We're going to do it with livestock. We're going to do it with money. We're going to do it with firstborn. And we're going to do all of that symbolically by setting aside an entire tribe of your nation for my wrath and judgment, symbolically speaking. Okay, let me just jump back from there. And let me just put this in a 21st century idiom. That sounds a little barbaric, right? I mean, the God that we grew up thinking about, the Sunday school God, the God of American Christianity doesn't behave that way anymore, surely. That's not really the way God actually is anymore. In fact, at this church, we don't talk about a God of wrath and judgment very much, do we? That's not appropriate in the gospel age to talk about a God of, of wrath and judgment. And it actually sneaks over into our, into our assumptions about ourselves. Even though we talk about our sin a lot here, because we're so inured to it, because we're so comfortable with the idea of God's salvation and grace being free, we have a hard time thinking about ourselves as really standing, except for some sacrifice, under the wrath and judgment of God. In fact, we even put it in religious terms sometimes. God is among us. We've all been touched by the Holy Spirit. We're all under the influence of God. We're all more or less good now. And so this Old Testament sacrificial system ought to be, ought to be put away. And maybe we shouldn't even think in these categories and terms anymore. And we might think, well, that's kind of a modern 
person of it. The reason we think that way is because this is 21st century America, and we've been touched by the gospel for two centuries here. Right? So it's a very Christianized, very New Testament culture that we live in, by some ways of thinking. But I want to suggest to you that that response to thinking about God's wrath and God's needing a sacrifice and sending a substitute to die, that response is not modern. That response is as ancient as can be. You know how I know? Because Numbers 18, where God is describing the priestly system, comes right after Numbers 17. And I want to tell you the story of Numbers 17. You guys turn back there for just a minute. This is unbelievable. Do you know what happens in Numbers 17? You do. You just don't know where it is. You've never heard this reference before. It's the rebellion of Korah. You heard the rebellion of Korah? Actually, it takes a couple of chapters. It starts in, in chapter 16. You remember Korah, right? Do you know who Korah was? This is the guy in, that you may remember from Sunday school whose whole family got swallowed up by a... Um, the earth swallowed him up because he rebelled against Moses. He's the one who's... The earth swallowed him up and he was seen no more and he got judged for his rebellion. But if you look into the details of the story, it applies so directly to what we're talking about. First of all, who was Korah? Anybody know? He was a Levite. Korah was a Levite. Korah was a guy who had been officially disinherited by God from a portion of the inheritance of Israel. And his job was to... Actually, the Levites had four um, families. One of them was Aaron's family, and one of them was th th three of Levites, uh, Levi's other descendants. And Korah was the member of the four, the family whose job was to take care of the dishes of the um, tabernacle. One, got one tribe, a sub-tribe of Levi had uh, in charge of the dishes. One sub-tribe had charge of the sacrifices. One sub-tribe had charge of the money. I don't remember how they divided it up, but Korah's family was dishes. And so they did the, took the the golden plates and the bowls and they arranged them and guarded them and kept people from touching and in exchange for that they were disinherited from owning any land and Korah got chapped about this and listen to, listen to what he said you have gone too far he said to Moses in uh, verse 3 number 16 for all in the congregation are holy every one of them and the Lord is among them why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord. Korah said, in effect, this whole system of disinheriting us, this whole system of making us constantly and perpetually face the wrath of God for your sakes, this is barbaric. We're all doing pretty good. We've been walking with the Lord here in the wilderness. The Lord has demonstrated his power and his presence among us, and we're all more or less holy. <laughs> this whole idea that we're supposed to perpetually bear the sin of other people I've had enough of it or maybe to put it in modern parlance is God really still all that concerned about covenantal things is he still all that concerned about this issue of sin is he still the kind of God that cannot abide sin and it must be dealt with? Is he still so holy that he is inapproachable? He stands off in holy, inapproachable light. I doubt it, said Korah. And the earth swallowed him up. And he was heard from no more. Big elaborate ceremony on Moses and Aaron's part, right? Where they take a bunch of staffs, one for each tribe, and they lay the staffs out. And in the, on the next day, Aaron's staff has grown flowers and is bearing fruit. And Moses said, that's the one who's real. The rest of you are dead. And he murdered or slew some of them, and the earth swallowed up Korah. As if to say, no, that's exactly who God still is. And it doesn't matter that your perception of how God's economy ought to work seems barbaric, and you judge it, and you say, I don't think God's really like that. It's not up to you. God actually is really like that. And so what do we learn from the story of Korah? That the priestly system, whereby God demands a sacrifice for sin, is not an invention of Moses and Aaron, but it's actually a reliable description of the way the world works. 
And when we talked a couple weeks ago about why did God choose to reveal himself in this crazy ancient Near Eastern sacrificial cult, the answer the Hebrews God gives us is that he made the world and it is the way he said it was. And his nature is to be utterly, unapproachably holy. So that, I think this is what I want you guys to chew on this. His, his nature is to be unapproachably holy so that the only thing that can stand in his presence is a dead sacrifice. The only thing that can stand in his presence is something dead. You see that? The high priest, when he goes into the Holy of Holies once a year, is a member of the tribe of Levi. <clears throat> the tribe of Levi. And his covenantal status with respect to the land of promise, what's his covenantal status? He's dead. He's, in the, the words of another place in the Old Testament, a scapegoat. Outside the camp, as it were, in a very real way. He's a representative of the judgment of God. He is the substitute dead thing. Right? So that the firstborn of the actual tribes that get, get land in the covenant don't have to die. The thing that stands in the presence of God is a sacrifice. Now, jump back up to Hebrews. Let's talk, talk about Hebrews again. Now that you've been reminded, you Hebrew readers, of the importance of sacrifice, let me just reemphasize that God has not changed his tune in some very important ways. The shape of his economy is the same. This is why I think it's important in this passage not to emphasize the differences between Melchizedek and Levi quite so much as the similarities. Right? Who is Melchizedek? What's his job? He's a priest. He's just like Aaron. Right? Which means that the system of which he is the apostle, the system of which he is the representative, is shaped the same as the one of which Aaron was a representative, of which Levi was a representative. And what is the shape of that system? What is the shape of that system? It's this, that nobody stands alive in the presence of God. That nobody stands alive in the presence of God. It takes a priest to stand there for you he has to be dead when he does it. Because God's holiness, God's holiness is unapproachable. Think about this for a minute. And this is Adam Andrews talking. This is not Hebrews guy, okay? But think about this for a minute. If I'm alive, if the, if the idea of life applies to me, and I stand somewhere, what's going on? What am I doing standing there? What strength am I balancing on my feet with? What is, what is in my mind when I stand in the presence of God alive? What's going through my head? As I stand like this. What's going, well, you know what's going through my head? What am I going to say? <laughs> right? What am I going to say next? How am I going to present myself? In fact, every impulse of my body and mind and soul is going to be geared toward presenting something now that I stand in the presence of God. And in the presence of a God whose holiness is infinite and utterly unapproachable, all of that stuff will damn me. It will all damn me. It will be filthy rags in the words of the New Testament. Wood, hay, and stubble in the words of another place in the New Testament. It will be an offense. Right? The aspect of the ancient sacrificial system that's applicable to this part of Hebrews is that dead things enter the presence of God because they cannot argue for themselves. They cannot present an account. They are inert. They are absolutely passive. And better than that, they have been consecrated. They have been consecrated and set apart for his use. How is it that something is consecrated again? How is it that something is consecrated in this 
ancient Near Eastern sacrifice cult of which God reveals himself by its death. It's consecrated by death. Fascinating stuff, right? So here's how it applies. Nothing living stands in the presence of God. His holiness is too infinite for that. Do not neglect so great a salvation because if you do, how will you escape? How will you escape if what you've got to stand on in the presence of God is something you've cooked up? Oh, disaster. Right at the end of Numbers chapter uh, 17, at the end of Korah's rebellion, all of the children of Israel are shook because what they've seen is an amazing miracle because Moses actually says, hey, this is what I want you to, uh, to uh, here's how I want you to interpret what happens next. If something happens next that you've ever seen before, God is not on my side. It's a great little scene. And he goes, but if God does something brand new in the history of the world, you can take it as proof that what I say is what God says. And at that moment, the earth opens up and swallows Korah and his family, and they go down into Sheol alive. And the children of Israel say, well, I've never seen that before. <laughs> I am undone. As a matter of fact, it's exactly the word they use. End of chapter 7. And the people of Israel said to Moses, Behold, we perish. We are undone. We are all undone. Everyone who comes near, who comes near to the tabernacle of the Lord shall die. We are all going to die. And Moses said, yes, you are. You are undone. Because that is how holy the God who made the world actually is. You cannot stand in his presence. And so, chapter 18, what I'm going to do is I'm going to consecrate the Levites. I'm going to slaughter them, covenantally speaking, in your place. And I'm going to apply their covenantal death to you so that you also can be covenantally dead, though you live in your bodies and you can stand in my presence. I'm going to let, I'm going to let it happen through a substitute because nothing living can stand before. In this context, we get the story of Melchizedek. In this context, we get the story of Jesus, a high priest in the order of, of the order of Melchizedek, to whom even the Levites pay tribute and tithe. Now let's talk about that for just a minute. I know I'm gonna go long today. I'm sorry, I just got all excited. What is it that the Levite, what is it that the children of Israel do to the Levites? What do they give to the Levites? Tithe. They give a tithe. For what purpose? So that the Levites can go on with their business of being a sacrifice, right? Of being a substitute, of enduring the death and judgment of the covenant in their place so that it will go easy with them before God. And Hebrews guy says, Levi does this too to Melchizedek. Even the Levites look to somebody and say, oh man, this covenantal death is too big a deal. I can't take it anymore. Will you take it for me? And Hebrews guy says, guess what? The Old Testament system of which I've been describing to you in great detail is a picture of something even better, something even greater. And its difference is that the high priest of that New Testament system, the one who comes after the order of Melchizedek, is not a human being. He's not a mortal like the Levites were. And he offers himself once and for all so that that continual sacrifice for his own sins doesn't need to be made. And more importantly, he is perpetually dead. He is slain before the foundation of the world and endures the wrath and judgment of God continually, covenantally speaking, and continually makes intercession for us. But underneath it all, Hebrews guy emphasizes that the shape of the economy is exactly the same. The shape of the economy is exactly the same. Nothing living can stand in the presence of God. And his wrath against 
We, talk, we call it sin, but I want to give another name to it today. His wrath against exertion is bottomless. His wrath against the living who would live is bottomless. You see what I mean by that? When we stand in the presence of God and we, we imagine that we have something to contribute, the urge in our flesh is to live, to survive, to create, to make, to make ourselves acceptable, to exert ourselves, to become ourselves, to be living and vital and whole and full and to take initiative. In that is the seed of the sin that... that um, God cannot abide. That's why in Numbers 18 it says over and over again, anyone who comes anywhere near the tabernacle will die. If you come anywhere near it, in fact, Levites, your job is to keep people the heck away. Keep them away. If they come near, if they take a step toward me, they will die. What? I thought God was approachable. Well, he isn't. <laughs> he isn't. A step in his direction is fatal. To live in his presence is impossible. And more than that, is an offense against his majesty. The Hebrews guy says, don't forget it. That's what the economy looks like. How will you escape if you neglect so great a salvation? Because Jesus has made a way Without undoing that system, he's made a way to fulfill it. To be perpetually in the presence of God in our behalf. In his death. In his sacrifice. So that we, as he'll say later on in, the, in Hebrews, can approach the throne of grace. Can go behind the veil with boldness. What? If you have an idea what the sacrificial system is symbolizes the economy that it symbolizes that is a mind-blowing thing to say you get to go behind the veil what alive what are you talking about i'm talking about the resurrection i'm talking about the veil ripped from top to bottom i'm talking about a completely new dispensation but it doesn't make sense it doesn't land in your heart if for 200 years you and your culture have been hearing hey god's easy it's no big deal with god you're all pretty well, more or less, righteous. We've been le learning for 200 years to say with Korah, all of us are, are holy, every one of us, and God is with us. And this whole thing about protecting the presence of God from of the approach of living things, that's a little passe and a little barbaric, and frankly, I'm better than that. And frankly, not only am I better than that, but God doesn't mind anymore. He does. He still does. The holiness of God is undimmed since the creation of the world. Nothing living can stand in his presence. And if it weren't for the death of Jesus, you couldn't either. But it is for the death of Jesus, though. That's the whole point of the gospel. Rejoice. Rejoice. The way has been made open for you to approach boldly the throne of grace. And this is why Hebrews guy is so excited wants to preach it to you not just as good news that your that your suffering and your sorrow have a solution not just in the words of Jesus come to me all you who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest the Hebrews guy thinks that too and he's going to talk about that as well but here in the beginning he's saying look covenantally speaking a gigantic barrier that is the death of your soul has been removed live in light of that barrier it will do you good that's what he's saying it will do you good to remember the thing you've been saved from it will do you good to remember that in the old days your own people there was a whole tribe of them that endured covenantal death as their lot in life so that you could be saved from the wrath of God and this has not changed you still depend for your life on the eternal covenantal death of one of your brothers. Live in light of that and rejoice at the mercy of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, I pray that the 
legal, theological, sacramental truth of your mercy would redound and resonate and reverberate through our circumstances and reverberate through our relationships and our, our quiet meditation before you. I know that it's easy to take a theology lesson and a Bible study and put it in a notebook and file it away for later. And I pray, Lord, that the, that the intimation here in Hebrews that your holiness is infinite and that we still stand in great peril except for Jesus would animate our lives, would animate our relationships and our circumstances, and that we would not fear but rejoice that you have saved us from that wrath and that your holiness is undimmed. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your holiness. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.